All right, good morning, everyone. If you guys open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this morning we're going to talk about what about prophecies. And um, there's an interesting verse here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that talks about it and mentions it. So if you guys are, go with me there, 1 Thessalonians 5, and let's just start in verse 15 and read through a few verses here to grab some of the context. He says, See that none... <clears throat> Excuse me. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. And I think verse 24 is a key verse that's going to be the, the main force of how we're going to do the things that's mentioned before it, because the one who calls us ultimately is who? It's God, and who's going to be the one to do the work in and through us? It's going to be God, and the means by how he does it is, is through his word. And so last time we, were, we talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5, we, made a, we looked at the issue of that the word and God are equal. The living God and his word are equal. And I think it's important to know that because a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people don't teach that. And, and what gets lost is, is that they don't have a Bible they can trust. And we fortunately have something that we can trust in. We have something we can believe in. We have something that we can have true confidence in. And that's what gives us the means that when we sit down, we read God's word, we study God's word, we're going to say, I believe that this is true. And then the God's word, the promises is that God's word effectually works in us that believes. And so if we don't have a Bible we can trust, a Bible we can believe, guess what? The things that's mentioned here is not going to happen in our lives. So I think it's important to note that. And so last time we talked about in verse 19 where he mentioned quench not the spirit. And we talked about the, the main thing that we need to be doing in our lives there is, is that we need to focus and begin to learn about the identity that we have in Christ. And the, and the things that God has blessed us with. And we have to study his word ultimately to be able to see how are we not going to do that. And the, the answer simply <clears throat> that we kind of concluded was is, is that we need to, in order not to quench the Spirit, we need to live out our identity that we already have been given by God. And so then the next verse, interesting verse there, he says, and it's another short one here. I, I love the end of this chapter here because he just gives us some, it's like bullet points, just boom, 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 down the list. And he says, despise not prophesying. And so I think it's important to look at the context of when was First Thessalonians written. And it's one of the earliest books that the Apostle Paul wrote. And if you go back with me, we, it's been a while since we've looked at it, but go back with me to the book of Acts and look at chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And we see here, <clears throat> this is basically when Paul came to the region and, and we see that some of the people here believed and that's why he's writing this letter ultimately in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And we see in uh, Acts chapter 17, in verse 1, it says, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollo, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, verse 2, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them. Notice where, though? Out of where? The Scriptures. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And then he says in verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not, notice what happened, what did they do? Moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come what? 
hither also. But who's the ones causing the uproar in the city? The ones that are accusing them of turning the world upside down. And then he says in verse 7, Whom Jason hath received, and these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And when they troubled the people and the rulers of the city, and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of other, they let them go. So we see that Paul's interaction there. And that's why when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he talks about how they received the word of God in much affliction. It wasn't, it wasn't, they were celebrated by everyone in the city saying, oh, they've received the gospel, we're so excited for them, but rather they received the word in much affliction. So Paul, later on, is writing to this church in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and we have to remember that during this time, Paul was traveling, and we also need to remember during this time, there's a transition of seeing the nation of Israel and ultimately their fall taking place. And it's important we're going to see to note that because of using that term prophecy. Immediately in our minds, when we hear prophecy, what do we think of? Old Testament, right? The prophets. You think of the prophets. So what were they doing during this time? We're going to see. Ultimately, go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And I think it's important to start thinking about and processing through some of these things because we have people today that claim that they're prophets. And that's an interesting to cl thing to claim that they're doing and, and that they're a prophet of God. And, and what we're going to see is, is that the prophets of God and that then the prophesying had a purpose. Okay, it was important. It was necessary. But we're going to see that those things also went away as time went on. And so in Colossians chapter 1, and look at verse 24 and 25. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. And then notice why, to what? To fulfill the word of God. How is he going to fulfill the word of God? Because God revealed to him the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, and then now Paul is going to reveal that to the world, which is what he was commissioned to do. Isn't that interesting? So during the time of the Apostle Paul, was there prophesying? There sure was. Why? Because God's word was not fulfilled yet. Okay, and we're going to look at some verses about that. And so during this time period, God's word, we can see, was God's word complete in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? No, there were still many epistles that's going to be written on later on after that. Do we today have God's completed word? Okay, it's important to think about that. Keep that in mind. The church at that time, was there the gift of prophecy during those times? It's okay to say yes. Yes, there was. We're going to see that that went away, though. At those times, there would be prophets, would you say, that would come and maybe say, thus saith the Lord. Now, today, guess what we say? This is what the Scripture says. Right? There's a difference. The term despise, that's an interesting term. It means to scorn, to disdain. And this one's kind of rough, to have the lowest opinion of. All right, so should we have that attitude towards prophesying? He says, despise not what? Prophesying. So what is prophecy? Prophecy, there's some interesting definitions on it. It says, to foretell future events, which we see that a lot in the prophets. Um, it says, to predict. And then it says, to foreshow. And then this definition, it says, in Scripture, to preach, to instruct in religious doctrines, to interpret or explain scripture or subjects, to exhort. Now, some of those things we would say, well, that still takes place today. We do some of those things today. But we do it by a different authority, by the way. Okay? We do it by a different authority. And so, when someone would come, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I think the context here helps to understand it too. When someone would come and claim maybe that they're a prophet, were they supposed to just take their word for it? No. Look why. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20, it says, Despise not prophesying, 
What is immediately the next verse? Prove what? All things hold fast that which is what? Good. So if someone would come and say, I am coming as a prophet. I am coming to prophesy. Were they to despise it? No. But what were they to do? Prove it. To prove means to what? You're going to try it. It's going to be tested. How were they going to do it? Well, in Acts 17, you have the Thessalonians, and there was a lot of issues there. The next group of people that Paul went to were who? The Bereans. And when they came and gave them the Word of God and was talking to them out of the Scriptures and the Word of God, what did they do? They went back home, they picked up their Scriptures, and they did what? They saw whether those things were so. You know what they were doing? They were proving it. They were trying it. They were testing it. So that was part of what they were to do if someone would do that. So how did the church prove the prophets? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And look at verse 37. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. It says, If any man think of himself to be a what? Prophet. And then, or spiritual. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, who's the one writing? The Apostle Paul's writing, are the commandments of what? The Lord. So if someone would come and say, I am a prophet of God, I'm here to prophesy to you guys, number one is the things that would come and the things that would be said by him would need to line up with what the Apostle Paul was teaching. So if someone claims to be a prophet and you go and say, well, this isn't lining up with what Paul is teaching, guess what? That man, that woman is a what? False prophet. Does that make sense? And so it's important that, that they made sure of that. Did the prophecy line up with Paul's teachings or did it contradict it? Many times the churches would write to Paul with a variety of questions. And how could they prove it? Well, people that had truly the gift of prophecy, and we're going to also see the gift of knowledge, would be able to help, help them in those times. Now today, do we need that? No, because we have the completed word of God. At that time, did they need it, though? They did. And that's how God worked. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, what's interesting is, is that 1 Corinthians 13 sits in between two really important chapters to describe to us and to be able to help us today with the issue of what happened to the spiritual gifts? What happened to the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge, the gift of tongues, right? And in between it is going to be a chapter that's going to show us how is God going to work today? What is God going to leave back today? And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and you look at verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And then notice verse 2, he says, And though I have the gift of, what? Prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge. Well, that sounds impressive, doesn't it? But then notice what he says. He says, And though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have no charity, I am what? Nothing. So was there a gift of prophecy? According to that verse, yes. Was there a gift to understand all mysteries and all knowledge? According to that verse, yes. But the church was putting so much more attention on the gifts, they were losing sight of the things that they were being taught. And what they lost sight of is, is that you can have all these things, you can understand all mysteries, you can prophesy, you can have knowledge, but if you don't have charity, guess what? It means absolutely nothing. What was the church doing? You think about it. What was the church doing? They were becoming so self-consumed with their gifts and what they could do, they lost sight of the importance that the acknowledgement of that is to bring people to Christ. What happens today in the church, by the way? 
It becomes more about the entertainment. It becomes more about the show rather than focusing on learning about the things of Christ. You know? They think they have these gifts today, by the way. The people back then that had the real gifts would come today and people would be like, well, these guys are frauds today because these guys actually had those gifts. And so we see that. But then look what he says. Go to um, verse 7. He says, Beareth all things. He's talking about charity. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Verse 8, though, says, Charity never, what? Faileth. And then he says, But whether there be, what does he use there? Prophecies, they shall, what? Fail. Well, what does it mean to fail? It goes away. It's done. And then he says, whether there be tongues, they shall what? Cease. Now we learned about some words in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, pray without what? Ceasing. He says, tongues are going to what? Cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall what? Vanish away. So if you look at the term prophecy and you look at the term knowledge, prophecy is the ability to declare divine truth and the ability to declare it not by natural means. Okay? They had that gift to do that. Knowledge was the, it was the impartation of divine knowledge and information that they would receive from God. Okay? If a person in the local assembly at Corinth received a word of knowledge from God, what were they supposed to then do? Declare it to everybody there. What were they supposed to do? Exercise their gifts to edify the body. Why is Paul writing this letter, though? What's one of the biggest things they're doing? They're not edifying the body. They're not doing it in charity. That's what he's talking about here. And so he says that it's going to cease. But then look at verse 9. He says, For we know in part, and we what? Prophesy how? In part. But when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be what? What's going to be done away? The gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge, the gift of tongues. Why? Because God's fulfillment of his word will be what? Completed. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the mystery being revealed. He's not saying that Paul is going to sit down and when he pens that last dot in 2 Timothy... That's it. He's talking about the mystery being revealed, being on full display. God gave it to Paul, and what did Paul do? He was supposed to go out and give it to the world. What did he do? He did exactly that. Notice what he says in verse 11. When I was a child, I did what? Spake as a child. And he's not talking about little Gabriella running around going da 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 da. Right? What is he talking about? He's talking about their spiritual maturity. And he says, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, notice what he says, I put away what? You know what he just told the church? He says, you guys are acting like a bunch of children. You guys need to grow up. And what you need to grow up is, is to understand that these things that you think and you're putting such a great importance on are going to go away. Now, Paul isn't sitting there and despising it say, and scorning it, saying it's useless, but he says the part of what, what's being used today is being used for a necessary use, but one day it's going to go away. And when it goes away, what are you going to be left with? And he tells them that. He says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. Verse 13, And now abideth. So now he's going to say, here's what's going to remain. Faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity. And we've just talked about it before of how charity and, and the love of God is the thing that's going to bind everything together. It's the bond of perfectness. That's what he refers to it in Colossians. And then he says in verse 14, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he may what? prophesy. They were focusing more on the issue he's going to talk about of what? Speaking in tongues. They thought that was more impressive. 
And then he says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries, but he that prophesies speaketh unto men to what? Edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, what does he do? Edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the what? Church. So the question is, do we have the ability today to prophesy? Yes. Right? Why? Because we have the Word of God right here. And what prophesies? The Word of God. Who preaches it? We, the members of the body of Christ. So should we despise prophesying? No, the verse is simple, right? Despise not what? Prophesying. But if I came to you and said, I'm going to predict that the stock market is going to go up 20% on Monday. And I predicted that. Some people would be very excited about that, by the way. Right? And then Monday comes along, and it goes down 20%. And then on Tuesday, I say, no, you know, that something happened there. It's going to go up on Tuesday. You know? Would I be a true prophet? No. Does someone have the ability to predict something like that today? Maybe if they're a good broker, right? But no. So if someone comes to me today and says, you know what, God came to me in a vision last night and he told me what he sees for you in your life. I'm going to say, well, let's go and see what verse is that. Well, it's not going to be in there. In fact, it's going to tell me that what he's doing is not correct. So we don't despise it, but we need to know where its place belongs. And so today we prove all things, and how we prove things is going to be by comparing them to God's completed word. That's how we compare it. And when you think about it, would you say that that's, there is a great need for that today? I would say that there is a tremendous need to be able to go sit down and look at God's Word and compare Scripture with Scripture rather than saying, oh, I listened to this preacher today and I think that sounded so good. I went and got his newest book and I think that this is just so great. How many, how many Christian people that would say Christian people live their lives like that? It's quite sad when you think about it. There's such a great need for that today. And what's sad is, is the church has become so consumed about how many people they have, what, what everything looks like, what it sounds like, and they've lost sight of the importance is and the foundation always needs to come back to the Word of God. It needs to come back to that. You know? And, and one of Paul's constant concerns what you see in, in, in his writings was that the church would exercise godly wisdom and discernment and would not fall for false doctrine. A lot of people that fall for false doctrine today fall because they look at, oh, well, there's prophesying today. There's still the gifts of healing today. There's still the gifts of tongues today. And it sounds good, but if you start to look at it and you think of, if you think of, if God is doing those things today, then God is completely failing. But when we start to see, no, God isn't dealing that way with mankind today, then we can see exactly what God's doing today. And so go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look at verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, For this cause... We also, since the day we heard it, and remember, by the way, Paul has not been to this church. He had not seen their faces. And notice what he says. He says, Do not cease to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the gifts of healing and tongues and be able to prophesy. Notice what his prayer is, though. He says that he might be filled with what? The knowledge of his will and all wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding. How do we get filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding? 
By getting into God's Word. Colossians chapter 3 says what? Let the Word of Christ dwell on you richly in what? All wisdom. Look what he says though in chapter 1 verse 10. When we're filled with the knowledge of His will and we, un and we have spiritual understanding, look what it says, that He might walk how? Worthy. There's a lot of people that think they're walking pleasing unto God, but they're not. How do we walk worthy? We have to have spiritual understanding. We have to have wisdom. We have to have knowledge. He says that he might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And then notice what he says, and increasing where? In the knowledge of God. The result of increasing in the knowledge of God, then look at verse 11, says, strengthen with what? All might. So the more we input God's word into our lives daily, by the way, then the more God is going to do what? Strengthen us where? In our inner man. And then he says, according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Verse 12, giving thanks to who? Unto the Father. Why? He says, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of of the saints, where? In light. The Father has done what? Made us, he's qualified us, he's made us capable now to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And how did he do it? He says, who had delivered us from the power of what? Darkness. It's sad to say this, it's actually really sad to say this, that a lot of churches, and I'm not a, I'm not a person that likes to name denominations, by the way, I don't like to do that because I think in every denomination there is people that are saved. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think there's a lot of people in those denominations that do have a desire to know God's Word. I, don't, I think it's a really bad habit, by the way, to call out denominations. Because what it does is, is it shuts people down. But the sad thing, the reality and the sad thing is, is that the power of darkness has a hold on most denominations. That's the sad thing to think about. Because you go to a lot of churches and then they have opportunities to share God's word, opportunities to share the life that Christ has now provided to us, and they don't share it. You go into a church and they can't even tell you the gospel. The church needs to be boarded up at that point because it's the most simple thing that we have. If we don't have the foundation and the simplicity of the gospel, none of this other stuff that we study, none of this other stuff we talk about, none of it matters. And so God took us and he delivered us from the power of darkness, but the reality is, is a lot of times the church is corrupted by that. And he says, though, what did he do with us, though, when he saved us? He's translated us into the kingdom where? Of his dear son. How did he do it? In whom we have redemption through what? His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How many churches do you walk in and they tell you you have to confess your sin? What did that verse just teach me? I don't have to confess my sin. Why? Because I have forgiveness in Christ. And by the way, we can give thanks to the Father for that. Because what did He do? He gave His only what? His only Son. For who? Us. And the Son did it willingly for us. By the way, if we despise prophesying, we don't get to understand the importance of who Christ is. Because Christ was what? Prophesied to come. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Beware lest any man do what? Spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after who? Christ. A lot of times you get, and you start listening, and when you start listening closely to a lot of people, you start to see that there's philosophy there, that there's vain deceit there, that there's traditions there, and the rudiments of the world. And the conclusion that we can come to is the same thing that that verse tells us is, is that if it's anything that's not after Christ, we need to beware of it. And then he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of what? The Godhead bodily. In who? In Christ. 
Paul wants us to pay attention. God wants us to pay attention and be aware of the things that surround us. One of the things that surrounds us and one of the greatest things that surrounds us is, is, is most people do not rightly divide God's word. And when we don't rightly divide God's word, we start looking at prophesying and we start looking at all these gifts and start looking at how we can get those gifts to apply and be in our lives. And then you got the other end of the spectrum. You know, I think about this. You've got people on the other end of the spectrum that would say, that start to understand God's word rightly divided, and then would start to say, you know what, all the prophesying, all this stuff, you know what, it's meaningless, and they begin to despise it. That's why we have that verse in our Bible, by the way. It says, despise not prophesying. And we start to draw lines sometimes and say, this isn't the way God works today. He's never done that. And then it's like, well, God works today, but not in the same way he worked through the nation of Israel. And, and we start to make distinguishing points of certain things that it doesn't necessarily line up or make sense. So there's both ends of it, right? The term despise, when you think about the term despise, is, is a lot of times it's going to refer to people that's holding fast. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5 real quick. 1 Thessalonians 5. And it's going to refer, a lot of times you're going to see that word despise in the Bible, and it's going to refer to people. And it's, it's honestly referring to the negative treatment we will receive for holding fast to God's word. And look, at, look what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 20 says, Despise not prophesying, prove all things. And then notice what he says, Hold fast that which is what? Good. So when we're not despising, by the way, how we don't do that, we don't despise prophesying, we don't quench the Spirit, we pray without ceasing, we give thanks in everything, we rejoice evermore, we prove all things, and you know what we need to be doing? Holding fast that which is what? Good. But if we, the, despi the term despise, go with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke. Luke chapter 16. I want to look at a few verses about that. Luke chapter 16. That's what's so wonderful about studying. Sometimes you look at a word and then you're like, man, this word's going to take me on a fun journey. And you know, the term despise is like one of those words. You look at it and you're like, whoa. And you start to see how many times it's used in Scripture and how it's used. And you start to look at it. But look in, in Luke chapter 16. In verse 13. Luke 16, verse 13. It says, no servant can serve what? Two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one, and notice what it says, and what? Despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and what? Mammon. And then notice verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they what? Derided him. And so what he's saying is, is, is we're going to have a choice in all of our lives that we're going to, we have the choice, and what he's talking about there is, is we have the choice we're either going to serve ourselves or we're going to serve God. And you start to think about what he's talking about there. He says, well, one you're going to love, the other you're going to hate. But then in our minds, well, I don't hate God. I love him. He says, well, we have to make the choice. Are we going to despise the things that God has taught us from his word and serve ourselves? Or are we going to uphold and hold fast to the things that God has taught us? Go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. In verse 9, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted where? In themselves. That they were righteous, and then notice what they do, and despised what? Other. So what do they do? They say, I'm going to trust in myself. I see myself as righteous. And what do they do? They despise the other. A lot of times, we might get despised, because we might say, and we do say, I know that I am secure. People will get mad about these statements, which is sad. I know that I am secure in Christ. I know that I could never lose my salvation. I know I'm sealed under the day of redemption, no matter what I do. And people will get mad about that statement. 
But what does that statement say? It says that I've taken and I've realized I can't do it on my own and I've fully relied on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he did the work. He completed the work. He finished the work. He sustains it. But there's people that would say, no, she is knocking at the door. See that? Unruly. You guys let me still hear. Man, what kind of operations me and Rain here, guys? Come on. Yeah. So one is despised, and the, and the issue is one is, thinks he's righteous, one is not. It's the story of the publican and the Pharisee. Go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And Lord Jesus Christ is standing before, before his crucifixion. And, he's, and, and look at verse 11, Luke 23, verse 11. And Herod, with his men of war, uses a different term here, set him what? At naught. And what? Mocked him. When people despise, what do they do? Exactly what this verse describes. They set it not and what? They mock. And arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And who are they doing that to, by the way? They're doing that to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Such a great passage right here. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10 and 11. We know Peter's talking to the nation here, and we know Peter's describing things of what the Lord Jesus Christ was. And by the way, this is the guy that denied the Lord three times. And now he's full of the Holy Ghost, and he's standing with boldness. And look what he says in verse 10. He says, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand, be stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was what? Set it not of you builders, which is become, notice what happened though, the what? The head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be what? Saved. So he says, the one that you despise, the one that you mock, the one you set at not, the one that you've cast away is the one now that's going to be the binding agent of all mankind. Think about that. And then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at verse, we're going to go back a few verses, but look at verse 18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what is it? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, what does it say? Knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach what? Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is what? I like what it says there. It's wiser than men. And the weakness of God is what? Stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not by many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are what? Called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and then notice what he says here, and things which are, what? Despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are 
are. Why? Why does God do all of this? It says in verse 29 that no flesh should glory where? In his presence. He takes the things that seem foolish, the things that are despised, the things that seem weak, and what does he do? He confounds the world with it. And then he says in verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory where? In the Lord. So can we be despised? Are we despised? But where can we glory? In the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So we see the examples of things that are despised. And we see how people despise. So should we despise prophesying? No. Look at a couple more verses. This is the verse that always comes to mind when I hear the word despise. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 12, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, it says, he's writing to Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy, and he says, let no man do what? Despise thy youth. Well, what is he talking about? He's saying, Timothy, when you go into these areas, Timothy was, always, Timothy was a guy that served with Paul, was faithful to Paul, was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would go into areas and he would have to establish things, wouldn't he? And so when Timothy would go to these areas, Paul says, let no man do what? Despise you. Don't let people put you off. Don't let people put you away because of your youth. But what's interesting is, is the verse doesn't stop. So he says, let no man despise thy youth. Now he's going to do something. He's going to say, these are the things that you need to do then, Timothy. And by the way, the things that Timothy needs to do are things that we all need to do. And he says, but be thou in what? Example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So the thing that Timothy needs to do, he says, let no man despise, don't let people put you away, but you need to go out, we need to go out, and then be what? Examples of the believers. How? The way we speak, the way we talk, the way we live, the way we act, the way we display things towards others, the way we participate in the world. We don't participate the way the world does. That's what he tells Timothy. Don't become just like everybody else. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for young, young people, when we think about it, and if you're under 40, you're considered young in the Bible. That's what I'm told. All right? If you're under 40, we need to go out and be examples. If you're over 40, what needs to happen? need to go out and be examples. It doesn't stop. Now, as young people, if we're not doing those things, it's going to be easier for people to despise us. So he says, Timothy, you need to go out and set a good example. You need to go out and live the doctrine. You need to go out and not be like the rest of the world. You need to go out and not party like the rest of the world. You need to go out and be an example of the believers. And you notice something in that verse. It doesn't say, Timothy, all these things are going to be so easy for you to do in your life. You know what, Timothy? You're going to just have so many friends in your life and you're just going to have such a happy-filled life all the time. It's not the case because in 2 Timothy, he's writing to him because Timothy's discouraged, because Timothy's tired. He's seen all these people that's left Paul. He's seen all these people that he went and ministered that turned their back now on the gospel. He doesn't say it's going to be an easy road, Timothy. He doesn't say it's going to be an easy road for us, by the way. But he says, let no man despise thee. Go in there, preach the word, stand on the doctrine. And he says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You see that? Every person, young, old, in between, needs to pick this up every day and read it. You know, one thing that bothers me is when people tell me they're too busy to do it. No one's too busy to pick this up and read it. We make the choice to not pick it up. It's a choice. If we really want to do something, we make the choice to make it happen. 
Timothy had to make the choice to sit down and pick it up and read it. He says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by, notice that term again, by what? Prophecy. Now, there's not a verse in the Bible that goes and foretells of Timothy, is there? So what prophecy is that? It's dealing with some of the word of God, right? And then he says, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Then he says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to who? Oh, we have to say, you know what? I'm going to give myself to God's word. I'm going to commit myself to God's word. And I'm not going to do it partially. I'm going to commit to it. You know, just as someone that's going to run a marathon, they have to make the commitment. I'm going to train every day. I'm going to eat properly. I'm going to sleep properly. I'm going to commit myself to that work. Now, if someone says, oh, I'm going to run a marathon, they're sitting at home playing on their computer all day, eating Doritos, guess what? It's not going to happen. If I say, I'm going to be, I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be spiritual, I want to live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, I have to get into the book and study it. We have to do that. And then he says, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and what? Them that hear thee. How do we protect ourselves? By taking heed to God's word. So it's not enough to say if we're young and say, Oh, you can't despise me. No, we go out and be examples. It's not enough if someone is older too and they say, well, you can't despise me and you have to, I'm older. Well, guess what? Have to be an example. All of us have to be an example. That's the importance of that. And then one last verse is in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, my time's up. Titus chapter 2. It's talking about looking for the blessed hope the one who gave himself for us. And then he says in verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And he tells Titus, let no man, what, despise thee. Now those verses were always, those are the two when I hear the word despise, those verses come to mind. And so, in conclusion, go back with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll finish up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's an interesting study, by the way, to go through despise, despised, prophecy, prophesying, so many good verses about it. But he says in verse 20, despise not prophesying. Don't put it away. Don't scorn it. But what do we do? Verse 21, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And then I think this one is probably the toughest one that he gets to is verse 22. Abstain from what? All, notice, appearance of evil easy to stand by when evil's around us. But what does he tell us to do? Abstain from all appearance of evil. And we live in a world that's becoming more and more evil. That verse is going to become harder and harder and harder. But is that verse still relevant today? Yeah. Is despise not prophesying relevant today? Quench not the spirit relevant? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. These are all verses that are relevant to our lives. They're so practical and simple. The bullet points. Should we despise prophesying? No, we shouldn't. Do they have a place today? Yes, they do. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to um, have a place that we can come to and study your word together and look at your word. Um, thank you for the, the scriptures being perfect and us having the ability that we can just come to and study it. Anytime we have a question, we can pick up, a, pick up your word and we can find an answer in it. Thank you for giving us the life we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you just for all, all the wonderful fellowship that we can have with one another and the ability to just come to you in prayer at any moment, at any time. Thank you for giving us your perfect Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his name we pray. Amen.